Economists have had different ideas about what rationality is. The dominant theory is the choice axioms, the expected utility hypothesis, and uh, Bayesian probability updating in case the probabilities are not known. But what the theory is about uh, is there's less consensus. So is it descriptive, is it normative, or is it as if for something else? Huh? So in von Neumann and Morgenstern, you find no claim that the theory is descriptive, nor that it is normative. Savage, in his view, uh, the theory is normative, but only in small worlds, like choices between gambles. And Ale and Elsbeck disagree, not even there, it's normative. There is a disagreement what the theory is about. And uh, the uh, point that I want to focus on is that uh, the theory is often defended, huh? even if it's not descriptive, and even one claims that it is not, may not be normative, then it's as if. So like uh, Milton Friedman making uh, the argument, yeah, we don't care, hmm? was it descriptive? As many neuroscientists believe, huh? it's just to making better prediction. And then we have a book by Daniel Friedman, another economist, who analyzed the last five, 50 years of expected utility modifications, including modifications like prospect theory, and conclude there's no evidence huh, that these use would predict out of sample. That means really prediction rather than fitting data. So what do we do in this situation? And I want to draw the attention to uh, the argument that uh, nevertheless, the theory is beautiful and it's general. Hmm? Beautiful, yes. Hmm? General, no. Hmm? As uh, John Kay and Mervyn King pointed out in their book, huh, it ignores all situations. It cannot deal with all situations about uncertainty. And that's most of the things we are in. Yeah? We are in the corona crisis. We are in a Ukraine war. Huh? Nobody really knows where it's going and what can happen. Savage was very clear. He said, a Bayesian decision theory, that's what his theory became named, hmm, is not about these types of situation. It's about small worlds. And uh, what I want today address is how can we extend the theory so that it can deal with situations of uncertainty and also with situations of intractability, that's Savage's uh, example, the theory cannot deal with situations which are well-defined, unlike uncertainty, but you can't calculate the optimal solution, even if it exists, like in chess or go. And uh, also, uh, how can we deal with situations of incommensurability, where different things do not have one common dominator, for instance, in value judgments? or in ethics. So that's the task I set here. And uh, let me start with the distinction between risk and uncertainty, just to get the concepts clear. Uh, <clears throat> as we all know, the idea goes back to Frank Knight. And risk, uh, I define it uh, using Savage's terms. Risk is a situation where we know all possible future states in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there are consequences and probabilities. That is, that we know uh, the uh, exhaustive and mutually exclusive set of all the future states that can happen, and also the exhaustive and mutually exclusive set of all consequences. Mm -hmm. And if it's risk, there are probabilities. So for Savage, a small world is defined by the state space. If you have the probability, it's risk. If you don't have them, it's ambiguity. And that's the world of finance theory. That's the world of uh, the Markowitz Merton tradition. And that's the world of most of economic modeling. 
And if there is a problem, a real-world problem that's about uncertainty or intractability, it's reduced to a lottery. Hmm? Uh, uncertainty means not that uh, only the probabilities are not known, as night is often interpreted, but the state space is not known. So we do not know everything can happen in the future. If you read Savage, he says uh, his decision theory is not applicable to situations like, and that hold your breath, planning a picnic. That's already outside of the theory. Because things can happen that you don't expect. And you cannot construct a probability theory over a state space which you don't know. And subjective probabilities don't help you in this situation. So, um, how do we deal with situations of uncertainty? And uh, I will give you an introduction today in the kind of tools that I research, which are heuristics. Huh? An example of satisfying fast and frugal trees, social heuristics. But let me start with a story. Um, <clears throat> in the spring of 2012, Mervyn King asked me to meet Andy Haldane in order to introduce him into the science of heuristics. So Andy and I met, and I ex gave him uh, examples like, how does a dog catch a frisbee? How does a baseball outfielder catch a fly ball? How did Harry Markowitz invest his own money <laughs> using a fast and frugal heuristic rather his optimization mod and so on. And Andy then said, oh, that's nice examples. Hmm? And also showed him less is more effects so that when a simple strategy can actually lead to better decisions or predictions than more. But Andy, being an economist, asked me, do you have any general theory? So I explained him the bias variance dilemma from machine learning and the general study of ecological rationality, not logical. And uh, four weeks later, when we met again, Andy had done calculations with the data of the Bank of England and said, I've now seen that the prediction that came out from, say, bias variance dilemma, under what situations? Uh, less information is better, or simpler models are better than complex models, they bore out. And for instance, he has shown that uh, for large banks, which have to estimate tons of parameters, and the simplification is much more beneficial than for small banks, so such things. And then he said to me, look, um, I've now decided to scrap the talk I wanted to give for Jackson Hole, and I will give a different talk. And the talk he gave in the summer was entitled, The Dog and the Frisbee. <laughs> And uh, it, the uh, Wall Street Journal gave it, named it the speech of the year. Hmm? And it was basically arguing yeah, that uh, there's an alternative to deal with uncertainty. And the financial system is clearly uh, again and again in uncertainty. And this alternative uh, can be informed by looking how real people including Harry Markowitz, or dogs, even dogs, make decisions. So let me um, uh, start with how baseball does catch a fly ball. It's the same as, as dogs do it. Huh? So there are two visions. One is, it's a complex problem. We need a complex solution. So how is the complex solution? No, you doesn't work. Could you forward it? Yeah. Uh, the complex is that you calculate the trajectory. Hmm? And note, the problem is not in calculation here. It's in estimation. For instance, the alpha zero is the initial angle with which the ball has been thrown or kicked. Yeah? Estimated. Good luck. Hmm? So, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, that's, by the way, very much like Milton 
Friedman explains the billiard ball example. And I'm going with this example now you from the baseball to this. Yeah? So he would say, yeah, the player calculates, hmm? and then we don't have to care about what he's doing. Hmm? And as John uh, pointed out yesterday, the result would be that the game would be totally uninteresting because everyone is perfect. And so, uh, for those who uh, know how to calculate a, a trajectory, you realize that I've left out a few variables, just to make it simple. So there's no spin, there's no wind, there's no direction of wind, no speed of wind, and so on. Yeah? But nevertheless. Now, the alternative is to study how real players actually make this decision where to run in this case. Hmm? And uh, there are a number of studies, and they find that players do not even try to calculate the trajectory, but they rely on adaptive heuristics. And I'll show you the most simple one, uh, which is the gaze heuristic. And it has three steps. First, fix your gaze on the ball. Second, start running, and then adjust your running speed so that the angle of gaze remains constant. So this player is doing it. And watch the player. is running in a way that the angle of constant, the red line, the angle of gaze is always constant. What happens? The player is exactly there where the ball comes down. So the heuristic carries the player. Do you want to see it again? The important point is, the player can ignore all the information that you have seen in the equation of the trajectory and also all the information I left out. And fixate is only on a single variable, the angle of gaze. So the art is, to, in this case, to identify the one or two powerful variables that are sufficient to solve the problem. And they are of a very different kind than uh, one would imagine with the ASIF model. And Patrick will notice immediately, it's an embodied heuristic. You need a body, you need to be able to run, and you have visual abilities, and you need experience, and it's also intuitive. Hmm? Studies show, if you ask player, how do you do it, most have no idea. They cannot tell this, but it's not necessary. It's intuitive. It's learning, yeah? and much of expertise is intuitive, and people cannot really explain what they do so well. Mm. But that's part of human intelligence. So uh, <clears throat> this example uh, does not really help central bankers to find regulators, uh, regulation models that do better. Mm. But as in Andy's speech, it gives you a different perspective what the questions are. Hmm? So the questions are, first, we are dealing with a world of uncertainty. Hmm? So we should maybe respect the evolved human brain and we might learn something. So that is the original uh, idea of uh, yeah, behavioral economics by Herbert Simon. So analyze what experts do, they can be investors, they can be any others, and then formalize that, hmm? and formalize the rules they use. Hmm? So those of you who do the investment here, hmm? uh, you use a number of heuristic rules to invest, not only one over N, diversification as Markowitz, but others. So formalize these rules. Hmm? so that you have a, an understanding, and then you can test where they work, where they don't work. That's a very different program as making as if models uh, of this. And I'll show you briefly uh, one of the uh, work that we did with the Bank of England. <clears throat> now, the problem is to predict banks that might fail. And uh, the structure here is a so-called fast and frugal tree. And it can deal with uncertainty, with intractability, and incommensurability. So, uncertainty, so the, the uh, fast and frugal tree is an incomplete tree that, uh, <clears throat> that has an exit on each of the nodes. So here it has three variables, it's four exits. A full tree 
has two, in this case, two to the n exits. So if you have 10 variables, you have 1,024. And its computation explodes. So that's one way that these simple trees deal with tractability. The second way is they deal with uncertainty, so they make it simple. Because as we will see in a minute, uh, under uncertainty, you incur, if you uh, fine tune on the past, you overfit. So you need to make it simple. And the third way, it, it can deal with incommensurability. Incommensurability means simply that not everything has a common currency. You find this in ethics, but you also find that in banking and finance. So for instance, the human body, the organs, are not commensurable. If your heart fails, yeah, a good liver doesn't help you. You can't compensate it. Yeah? So here, hmm, for instance, UBS, uh, before the financial crisis, would have failed on the first variable. The leverage ratio was uh, too small hmm? and a uh, red flag. But UBS would have done well on the others. In that tree, huh, the others variables cannot compensate. So there's a rank order. See that point? So you can incorporate that. Hmm? So I'm not going into this in uh, more detail. That's a research program. A research program is uh, <clears throat> the, has, has three questions, which is, the first one is descriptive. What's in the uh, adaptive toolbox of an individual, a team, or an organization, or entire culture? And that can be social heuristics, like imitate, uh, successful. And that can be heuristics like those you have seen here. And in general, uh, uh, we are studying uh, about half a dozen classes of heuristics. One is uh, social heuristics. Another one is one uh, reason heuristics. You've seen the gaze heuristic, where there's a dominant reason yeah, that just overwhelms everything else. Huh? And the third one is our lexicographic structures, like the fast and frugal tree you have seen. And then uh, a the fourth one is situations where you tally, like 1 over n, huh? where there is no dominant reason, but you uh, don't even try to estimate the weights because the error due to overfitting will outweigh the error that you have due to bias. Hmm? So that's the classes. And the, the question about where do the heuristics come from are partly uh, from we can learn from the human brain we can learn from animals. The gaze heuristic is used in the same way by hawks who intercept doves. And by the way, it also was built in the first anti, uh, the first air-to-air -air missiles. And so these heuristics have a much broader uh, range of application than upon. The question of ecological rationality is a new one because it's normative. It's a question, given a class of heuristic, like the fast and frugal tree, huh? in what situations will this uh, heuristic do better than a competitor? Competitor could be logistic regression in that case. And uh, the studies with the Bank of England showed that the tree I showed you actually does better than logistic regression. <laughs> Although logistic regression has more information, but that's the problem under uncertainty, not the solution. So or another question would be, so uh, Harry Markowitz uh, used 1 over n instead of his own uh, mean variance uh, portfolio. In what situation can we expect that 1 over n will uh, make more money or have a higher shop ratio than Markowitz mean variance portfolio? That's a question. That's a question of ecological rationality. And the question is, is, is it the more, uh, the, more we, uh, so the more assets you have, yeah, then you can see from statistical theory uh, the less reliable uh, the uh, optimization method will be because it will overfit more. Hmm? And so you can detail that. And finally, the question is about intuitive design. So uh, 
So how can we use all of that to design decision theories that work better uh, than others? And let me, uh, I apologize for, for this. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> that I have reconstructed my talk, that's the old talk that you see here. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> so these are the classes. And I, I give you, run you simple, uh, quickly through a, a, an example about uh, research. So here's the question, the following question, how can a business predict which customers will buy again? So from, from based on a huge customer base and with lots of data, and uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> so one, again, we have two visions. One is, it's a complex problem. We need a complex solution. And here is a standard model for marketing. I'm not going to any details. You just look at it, be impressed. and yeah. It has lots of parameter, and that that's will be the problem. Hmm? Uh, now, that's, the other vision is to study how experienced uh, uh, managers actually make the decision. And uh, the answer is that uh, one of the, uh, the typical heuristic being used is the so-called hiatus heuristic. If a customer hasn't purchased in nine months or some other hiatus, classifies inactive, otherwise as active. It's again a one good reason heuristic. All other information is ignored. I show you briefly a study by two professors of management who believed in the Pareto negative, uh, negative binomial model, but went out to show empirically which is actually better, as opposed to what's currently mainstream behavioral organisms who know already what's better, hmm? and blame managers as having cognitive illusions or something like that. Huh? That's a non-empirical science. So. Uh, that was the result. They tested the, the databases of three companies, an airline, an apparel, and CD now, and they found that in the uh, airline, the hiatus heuristic predicted 70% of the customer's behavior correct, the Pareto negative binomial distribution, 74. The same for the apparel, and in CD now it was equal. You just saved all the computation and all the hassle. Huh? This is called a less is more effect. The Pareto negative binomial distribution model has all the information that the heuristic has and does more computation. Nevertheless, it's not as good. So let this sink. Less is more effects occur under uncertainty, but never under risk. That's very important. That means that the entire story about heuristics associated with biases is plainly wrong. It's only a story about uh, situations of risk, and uh, almost all of behavioral economics is regrettably about risk. Very different than Simon imagined. Yeah. So um, the study then uh, was argued, but maybe the, the uh, you could argue maybe the Pareto negative binomial distribution isn't as good as what you thought. How about huh? logistic regression? How about machine learning uh, techniques? like random forests. And how about other companies? Maybe they, hmm? so. It's always interesting that nobody ever asked, couldn't there be another heuristic, even simpler, that could be better? That's never asked, but that's the thing. So we ran studies with not three, 35 companies, the data. We ran studies against not the uh, CD uh, uh, now, uh, sorry, uh, the Pareto model, but with, uh, big horses. Just look at the, at the left side. These are now the average over 35 companies. And uh, what you see here, we have uh, uh, the gray one. It's another marketing model. It's even worse than the Pareto negative binomial model. Logistic regression does better. Random forest, it's one of the, um, yeah, uh, big uh, machines of machine learning uh, does about the same, and none of them can beat the one reason heuristic across all 34. And uh, on the other side, these are a number of other studies with other repeat things. So uh, whether a patient would uh, uh, be uh, 
come back to the hospital within a certain time, or there would be another tornado in, in something. And you can see big data doesn't help you very much. Hmm? And big computation doesn't help. It's uncertainty. So, and uh, then the question arises, which is the interesting question. After showing less is more effect, but like Andy Holland's question is, can we understand when they happen, when they don't happen? And I'll show you a mathematical proof just in, uh, that's intuitive, that uh, explains when a single cue, like in the heuristic that I showed you, uh, can never be beaten by any linear model such as logistic regression. So the situation is called a dominant Q. And uh, the illustrate there are five uh, uh, Qs, and uh, their weights are conditional to the weights of the for, like beta weights, so the additional contribution. So if the additional contribution of the other Qs, the sum, uh, doesn't exceed that of the first one, you can see. Hmm? Forget about all the others. Huh? So that's uh, the study of ecological rationality. And then you ask, uh, so in, uh, in how many situations do we have dominant cues? Not in all, but in quite amazing many situations we have found. Huh? There's about half of the situation, but the uh, machine learning data sets has a dominant cue. Hmm? And the others don't have. And then you need to go tallying or one over n. So uh, these are the methodological principles. You need formal models of heuristics, no vague labels like system one or the story, so which are the nadir of psychological thinking, uh, uh, dichotomies. Uh. Good science starts with dichotomies, goes into formal models. It's the only case I know where it went the other direction. So there, were, there are uh, quite uh, clear models about both deliberate and intuitive thinking, and it just ended up as a well, two systems somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, then let me just uh, wrap up. Uh, competitive testing, as you have seen, and test of predictive power, as Milton Friedman said, and I worked my way through to the end. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> I was talking about the difference between risk and uncertainty. Hmm? And decision making under risk requires logic and statistics, but under uncertainty requires more. And logical rationality is not the same as ecological rationality. Ecological rationality is about the success in the world. Logical rationality is about consistency. And under uncertainty, we have less is more. And it gives us a lesson that we can be much more efficient uh, in the information we use than we do. And there was a remark about the methodology. We need to check the models by uh, testing in the future, not just data fitting. And I think that's a vision about uh, changing behavioral economics into what it once was huh, or supposed to be. Herbert Simon's idea is take uncertainty seriously, take heuristics seriously, and take people's minds seriously. Thank you for your attention. Um, this is called Ways of Knowing. And um, I will go through a summary. <clears throat> My summary is you can try to understand the world using data, intuition, models, and theories. A lot of this is described in a book that I wrote about 10 years ago called Models Behaving Badly. Um, so. In brief, just to give a look ahead, raw data really doesn't have a voice. It takes models, theories, and intuition to use data. And then I'm going to argue that models are metaphors that explain the world we don't understand in terms of things we already do. Models only tell you what something is more or less like. They don't tell you what it actually is. Theories try to tell you what something really is. And finally, it takes intuition to discover a theory. And at the end, I wanna briefly argue that financial models are metaphors, they're idealizations that always sweep dirt under the rug and good models and good modelers have an obligation to make the dirt explicit so that people who use the models will um, understand what their flaws are. <clears throat> so how do we approach understanding the world? 
And um, I've got original background in physics and I have a PhD in physics. I worked in research for a while and later on I moved to finance. Um, so I wanna invoke some physics here. How do we approach understanding the world? Um, the great triumph at the dawn of modern science was the understanding of gravitation and of the motion of the planets. And for millennia after the Greeks, scientists' prejudices led them to describe all planetary movements in terms of circles and epicycles about a fictional stationary Earth. But actually, um, although the stars, if you go out at night and look up at the sky, although the stars really do rotate about the Earth because the Earth is rotating, but the planets, as seen from the orbiting Earth itself, we now know that the Earth orbits about the sun, planetary motion is too complicated for a single circle. And so it needs circles moving on circles, moving on circles. The word planet actually comes from the Latin word planeo, which means to wonder, uh, W-A-N-D-E-R, uh, because the planets don't move smoothly through the sky. They go forwards and sometimes they go backwards in what's kind of a retro, called a retrograde motion. And eventually, Copernicus pointed out that the Earth wasn't stationary, that the Earth and the planets orbited the sun, and that the planet's weird retrograde motion in which a planet went forward and then went back for a while wasn't intrinsically the planet's motion, but was a consequence of the Earth actually moving in its orbit further along its orbit than the external planet moved on its orbit. And so relative to the Earth, the planet seemed to move backwards for a while. <clears throat> That's where things stood with Copernicus and then Johannes Kepler came along and in the early 1600s, he examined the data on planetary positions given to him by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe and formulated three really astonishing laws, um, not quite heuristics, but laws um, which don't really have explanations at this point, but describe consistent, consistent patterns of planetary motion. <clears throat> The first one is that planets move in ellipses about the sun. It took him a long time to come up with this. An ellipse has two foci. It's not a circle. And um, it took him a long time to get to that. The second one, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more detail on the next slide, is that the line between the sun and any planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. This is really phrased um, in a sort of complicated but simple way that the line between the sun and the planet, as it, the planet moves, sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And finally, so th this relates the position of the planet at one point in the orbit to another. And finally, the third law is that the square of the orbital period is proportional in years, is proportional to the cube of its distance from the sun. And this relates the <clears throat> periods of different planets to each other. I want to talk a little bit about Kepler's second law. And it really gives some insight into the miracle of how people come up with discoveries. <coughs> what Kepler states, which I've illustrated here, is that the line between the sun and a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And I drew the yellow sun at its focus here and the orbit of, say, the Earth around it, the, the uh, ellipse is somewhat distorted. It's not really that far from a circle, but it is. But I've distorted it to make it very, very elliptical. And then if you look at the green sort of arc or triangle on the left and the green one on the right, they both have equal areas. So that as the planet moves, the areas swept out in the same amount of time are the same. And therefore, the planet that is nearer has to move faster to sweep out an equal area. And the planet that is further, which is over here um, on the right, has to move slower to sweep out the same area. And this deep symmetry of planetary motion, which later under Newton turns out to be equivalent to the law of conservation of angular momentum, as I said, implies that the closer the planet, the more rapidly it moves. The astonishing thing for me is that there is no line between a planet and the sun for Kepler to observe. His data merely consisted, God knows how he did it without computers, his data consisted of planetary positions in the night sky. There's no line that he could observe and it's sort of astonishing that he decided to describe the motion of the planets in terms of any visible, invisible imaginary line. No one knows exactly how he, did, how he got to this, 
but it involved long immersion, years of struggle and associative thinking, and then finally some kind of aha intuition followed by checking the data. He, he had many, many trial attempts at all of this. <clears throat> A couple of decades later, <coughs> excuse me, Newton comes along and the point is that Kepler's laws, as I said earlier, they describe the patterns of the planets, but they don't explain any causes. And Newton comes along and, and postulates and finds a cause, and he shows that Kepler's laws are actually a mathematical consequence of his own theories, of which there are two. The theory of gravitation, which says that different, different masses attract each other with a force proportional to the square of the, uh, the product of the two masses and divided by the distance squared. That's the inverse square law of attraction. So that's the theory of gravitation. And then that just tells you the force, but then he has to have a law of motion. And his law of motion is that force equals mass times acceleration. So the first, the first bullet point, the theory of gravitation tells you the force. And the second one lets him comp compute the acceleration. And with calculus that he just, invents on the side, he can calculate the motion of the planets. And what he shows is that they everybody accepts Kepler's laws and he shows that his theories actually describe, produce, predict Kepler's laws. How did Newton discover his theories? Um, for sure the orbiting planets and the falling apples didn't announce the laws that drove them. He comes up with something much more abstract than simply looking at um, um, something much lower level or deeper than looking at simple simple movement and objects. So I want to talk about intuition, first of all, which is something that Professor Gigerenza spoke about too. And I like to argue that it takes intuition to discover the nature of the world. And if you look at what Kepler, Newton, I'm invoking mostly physicists here, but I will get away from that. Kepler, Newton, Ampere, Maxwell, Einstein, Dirac, who predicted the existence of the positron, all of them, get to the starting point of their theory by some feat of intuition. And intuition may sound casual, but it takes intimate knowledge of the world acquired by careful observation and painstaking effort. And everybody's very in love with reasoning and logic these days, but reasoning can only begin when intuition has put down an idea. And that's what um, Kepler does later on. That's what Ampere does um, when he discovers the law of uh, force between currents. And um, if you look, uh, there's, a, there's a famous speech that Keynes gave about Newton when he discovered in 1942 a box of, somewhere in some Cambridge college, a box of papers of Newton's that had been there for hundreds of years. And he looked through them all and he gave us, well, he actually intended to give the speech in 1942, but he had to wait till after the war, by which time he was dead and his brother gave the speech. And you can find it anywhere on the internet. Um, and one of his sentences is, I fancy his, about Newton, I fancy his preeminence is due to his muscles of intuition being the strongest and most enduring with which a man has ever been gifted. I believe that the clue to his mind is to be found in his unusual powers of continuous concentrated introspection. His peculiar gift was the power of holding continuously in his mind a purely mental problem until he had seen straight through it. He goes on, but um, I've taken out one of the critic, I've, I've extracted here, excerpted one of the critical sentences. Similarly, Maxwell, I don't have time to go into it, but Maxwell says the same thing about Ampere. Ampere dis discovers the law of force between two, um, two current loops and um, tries to claim that he's derived it by logic, but Maxwell points out that in, in Ampere's argument, it's impossible to isolate the, the current elements that he wants to argue about. And again, this is a feat of intuition and Maxwell actually comments on it in great detail when he comes up with his theory of the electromagnetic field. So intuition, I like to think of intuition as a sort of entanglement between the observer and the object. So the observer becomes so close to the object or the person that he's trying to understand that he begins to experience their existence from both outside and inside them. And intuition is kind of a merging of the observer with the observed. A second mode of understanding that people use um, beyond intuition is theories. And 
I like to distinguish between theories and models, which I'm going to do here. Um, theories are deep descriptions of the, to me, theories are deep descriptions of the laws of the world. Theories can be right. They're attempts at deep descriptions. They can be right. They can be partially right. They can be totally wrong, but they have a certain epistemological or ontological quality. What all theories have in common is that, like if you know the Bible, like God's voice to Moses um, from the burning bush in the desert, they proclaim, I am what I am. Theories say this is the way the world works. They stand on their own feet. They're not analogies, they're facts. And Newton's laws saying force equals mass times acceleration is a theory. Uh, the law of uh, gravitation inverse square law is a theory. They simply say this is the way the world works. Newton's laws um, have been supplanted 300 years later by Einstein's, but that doesn't mean that Newton's an approximation to Einstein. In this, it's, Einstein is more accurate, but both Newton and Einstein are theories. New, uh, uh, as an analogy, Newton is to Einstein as cursive writing is to typing, or as navigation by the stars is to the global positioning system. Cursive and typing are both different ways of transmitting information, but cursive is not approximation to typing. They're two different approaches that, approaches that reach the same end by different means with different accuracies, but one is not an approximation to the other. Um, both Newton's laws and Einstein, starting from a different point of view, are theories. One may be more accurate, but they're both theories that more or less describe the facts. I like a quote from Goethe from long ago that says, one day we will realize that every fact is really a theory, meaning a description of a fact is a theory. I've been talking a lot about physical theories, but I want to give an example. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time here, but um, somebody can let me know. Um, I want to give an example of what I think is a non-physical theory, getting away from physics, and that's Spinoza's theory of the emotions where he, you, where he describes the emotions as derivatives. If you look at the ethics, Spinoza, around the same time as Newton, tries to treat emotions the way Euclid treats geometry. And so in the same way as Euclid starts out with points, lines, and planes as his primitive, and then eventually derives Pythagoras' theorem by a bunch of logic and reasoning, Spinoza starts out with three primitives, which are desire, pleasure and pain. And he actually defines them, but everybody knows pretty much because of their embodiment, what desire, pleasure and pain are. And then he's kind of utilitarian. He says, good is everything that brings pleasure. Evil is everything that brings pain. And then he moves up one level. Love is pleasure associated with an external object. So all, all of his higher level emotions, the primitives are desire, pleasure and pain, but all the higher level, and they're almost visceral, but all the higher, higher level emotions eventually lead down at the bottom to desire, pleasure, and pain. So love is pleasure associated with an external object. Hate is pain associated with an external object. Envy is sort of a double derivative. It's pain at somebody else's pleasure. Um, fear is expectation of future pain. Um, if you want to think of envy, for those of you who are in finance, you can think of envy as a convertible bond, just as it links down to pain and pleasure, a convertible bond links down to equity and debt. Um, finally, he has, not finally, but among them, he has a triple derivative, cruelty. He calls somebody's desire to inflict pain on someone that's loved. He also has three more primitives, which I won't go into, um, vacillation, wonder, and contempt. Wonder is actually what Moses experiences at the burning bush which is when you're confronted by something that doesn't fit any of the categories that you already have for understanding things. I made a diagram when I read Spinoza of all of the emotions that he derives. And um, you can see how in the end, every one of them leads down to, I don't know if I can highlight this with my, with my mouse, but pain, desire and pleasure and everything else, disappointment, shame, hate, compassion, melancholy, suffering, fear, self-abasement, they all in the end lead down to these three visceral things. The reason I'm going into this is that I think this is really a theory. It's a description. It may or may not be accurate, although I think he's actually centuries ahead of behavioral finance and that he comes up of behavioral economics or behavioral psychology and that he comes up with the behavioral theory long before um, anybody else does and it involves derivatives. 
And I'm giving an example of a theory because it doesn't rely on analogies. In contrast, another way of understanding things, and one uses both theories and models, which I'm going to talk about now in physics, are models. And models are, I want to give an example. Um, there's a, a nice line by Arthur Schopenhauer where he says, I'm quoting here, sleep is the interest that we have to pay on the capital, which is called in a death. And the higher the rate of interest and the more regularly it is paid, the further the date of redemption is postponed. Um, this is bad for me, given that I'm up in the middle of the night right now. Um, so he's making an analogy here. He's saying, if you, if you buy a bond, you have to pay regular interest and eventually have to pay back the capital. If you sleep, um, you have to sleep every night. And because of the similarity between the periodicity of sleep and the periodicity of bond, re, of bond coupon payments, he then says, since you must have borrowed money and paid it back, you must have borrowed life from the darkness. You pay it back every night and you pay back the principal at the end. This is kind of a clever metaphor. And metaphors are an insight that something is a lot like something else, although it's not identical to it. And um, to me, a model is a metaphor. It compares something we don't understand, in this case, like sleep, to something we already do, which is bond repayments, coupons. Um, physics is full of models as well as theories like Newton's and Einstein's. There's a famous liquid drop model that got a Nobel Prize. It's a model of the atomic nucleus that pretends for a while that the nucleus is like a liquid drop of water that can vibrate and rotate and even fission into two. It's very useful. It got a Nobel Prize. It explains lots of things about the excitations of nuclei. It's picturesque, but it's obviously not entirely true. The nucleus is not a liquid drop. It's made out of tons of protons and neutrons, which are made out of quarks, et cetera, et cetera. A liquid drop isn't really a liquid drop in the sense it's made out of atoms. In a similar way, the Black-Scholes financial option model compares the uncertain movement of stock prices to the diffusion of smoke from a cigarette tip. It says stock returns drift out through the future the way smoke diffuses from a cigarette tip. It's useful. It's up to a point. But it's not true. That's not the way they exactly behave, and it's not fact. Theories tell you what something is. Models really tell you only what something is more or less like. And models are sort of metaphors. As I said, they kind of graven images of reality, but not reality itself. And one of the dangers with finance is that because models are analogies, their incautious use by taking them too seriously when they're wrong can unleash all the dangers of idolatry that God warned against in the second commandment. If you take a model, which is really a man-made thing, think of Pygmalion and assume that it's actually God's truth. The last mode of understanding is um, very popular these days is data and statistics, the statistical analysis that lies between big data, lies behind big data, machine learning. Statistics seeks to find past tendencies and correlations in data. Often people assume they will persist, but statistics only looks at the past, as everyone knows, and correlation doesn't imply causation, as somebody once um, famously said. So big data is useful, but at least to me, useful as it is, it's not a replacement for the classical ways of understanding the world. Data doesn't have a voice. There isn't anything like raw data. A human being has to decide what data they're going to look at, just like Kepler did. Choosing what data to collect takes insight. Making good sense of it still requires the classic methods, meaning a model, which is an analogy, a theory, which is an attempt at description, and is deeper, or intuition to begin with to find a cause. Um, Wittgenstein somewhere says philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. I take that to mean that language can deceive our natural intuition and you need philosophy to try to reclaim what you really mean as opposed to what you think you're saying. And I think in a similar sense, science is a battle against the smothering of our intelligence by too much data. Um, I wanna just finish off by talking briefly about financial models. Um, my, my, my argument is in physics has theories like Newton's laws, Einstein, Dirac, Maxwell, Ampere, et cetera. Um, 
and it has models like the liquid drop model or all kinds of analogies that are used for a while, Bohr's model of the atom, but are not really um, fact. In finance, they really, I don't know of any genuine theories in finance. Finance only has models, analogies, um, attempts to map what, um, what we try to understand about mental things, which are stock prices. Stock prices are not physical things and tries to map their behavior onto physical things which we do understand like the diffusion of a gas. So there are no genuine theories in finance. Um, I believe one should therefore avoid axioms. The world doesn't satisfy them. Um, physics is different from finance. In physics, it really pays to, drop, to, to look at the, mo the movement of the planets like Newton did, and then drop down very deep and say F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, which has nothing obvious to do with the planets use fundamental variables, formulate this principle that's very deep, and then come back up again to see what it predicts about the motion of everyday objects. In finance, I think shallow is better. And I suppose this is related to Professor Gigerenza's comments about heuristics. I think in finance, shallow is actually better. And it's better to not, although it's tempting and one does drop down deep sometimes, um, most of the time it's better to use more vulgar market variables and think about them in a sophisticated way. So if you build models, if you build more detailed models that drop down deep, you're always sweeping dirt under the rug and that's okay, but you have to be honest and tell people about it. And I like to think of models as none of them being true, all of them being good Duncan experiments, imaginary experiments, simulations in imaginary worlds that don't exactly resemble our world, which is much more complicated. So um, I'm wrapping up because of what I said, I think the solution to our financial crisis will not lie in better mathematical models. Um, nevertheless, modeling is useful. Um, William Blake wrote, if a fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise, which in this concept means it's good to take models seriously up to a point and maybe even be foolish to the point of using black shoals and calculating all sorts of sophisticated things. But then, so a little hubris in taking models seriously is very good and being a fool that persists in his folly, but at some point you have to realize that you may have gone too far and catastrophes strike when the hubris evolves into idolatry. Uh, somewhere between these two extremes, sort of north of common sense, but remaining south of idolatry is the region for the wise use of models. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And Two really interesting presentations. Um, I suppose one of the issues we have about models and heuristics, I think both of you kind of concluded that simpler decision rules might be, be better than the more complex rules. And part of the question then linking to um, we're dealing with an uncertain world, and that's possibly why models which are predicting continuity may not work so well. But one of the main difficulties I suppose we have in finance is to predict the, the shocks. And I think you also talk in your paper that the difficulties of, of models is how to predict the financial crisis or, or deal with that. So you talk about the adaptive heuristics. How does that help? Is it possible through heuristics rather than modeling to predict when the world will will turn that's a good question so first the uh, uh, traditional finance theory is based on a world of risk its probability theory and assumes a stable world so uh, it not only misses every disruption or crisis but more important it creates an illusion of certainty so think about what Lucas said a few years for the financial, before the financial crisis hit. Yeah? He basically suggested that uh, macroeconomic theory has solved forever the problem of a crisis. Yeah? So that's the illusion of certainty. Yeah? And uh, so it is uh, the, the <clears throat> so that's my first answer. We need to look for something different and get out of this confusion between uh, probability theory hmm, uh, is not about everything. Mm. Yeah? 
that has been known since long. So early uh, insurers in the 17th century insured life, but not ship. Because life, you can do statistics. With ships, you need to have the, the latest news about uh, pirates, about the crew and the captain. Mm -hmm. So, so they, uh, they didn't use statistics for that. And we need to realize that, mm, that we create illusionary models mm. that work for some time, yeah, as long as nothing happens, but fails every other time. Mm. But, but can, can, yeah. can other ways of thinking about the world, the heuristics, can they help us overcome these problems? Yeah. And, and uh, how do you know when to adapt the heuristic to a new decision rule? If you start with a, a very simple one yeah. key so the, uh, it is still the problem uh, remains uh, how to predict a, uh, mm -hmm. a crisis and heuristics may not be able to predict what cannot be predicted, but they can help you get out of the illusion of certainty and build walls. For instance, uh, the, um, <coughs> uh, the kind of fast and frugal tree I showed you. Uh, so if you would do have a leverage ratio of 10%, uh, a weighted ratio of 20%, and a certain good liquidity, you build a wall. Mm -hmm. And you don't even try to do something exact. Yeah? That may not be in the interest of some people, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. So, Professor uh, Durbin, maybe a similar point. So again, in the, in the simpler models, how will the, the simpler models be able to overcome some of the problems of, of changes in the system. Oh, are, you, are you speaking? Yeah. Sorry, yes, I'm trying. Uh, are you addressing me? Yes, I'm hoping to. Yes. Okay, sure. Uh, um, so, so yeah. again, with, with, with the models, and you talk about in finance, we need simpler models. Um, and again, models which can adapt. But we see that I think it was uh, Merrin Somerset Webb who summarized yesterday that in finance, it's one of the areas where we don't actually learn. We make the same mistakes over and over again. So why is it that we don't learn in finance? And to what extent are the models part of that problem? Yeah, I, w I want to agree with, with Professor Gigerenzer about what he said about them using a bunch of heuristics. And 20 years ago, I used to work at Goldman Sachs and actually they were pretty good at risk management. And I used to watch the risk management, the weekly risk management meetings. And one of the things they were good at was taking what I thought was at corresponds to what Professor Giger and saying was taking a very eclectic approach to risk management. They were smart enough not to just rely on value at risk or one metric, but to have a bunch of different things that essentially constituted a wall, as he said. So they would look at um, not too much exposure to one country, not ex too much exposure to one counterparty. If anybody had owned a position for more than a year, they had to get rid of it because there was no good reason for keeping it anymore. Um, so they had, I don't know, tens of these things that could prevent somebody from continuing to, to hold the position. Um, a lot of the less sophisticated banks, I think, tend to rely much more on one single heuristic like value at risk, which was really um, not very reassuring. In terms of why financial models, um, why finance has so much trouble, I don't know. I think, first of all, it's intrinsic that people cannot be understood completely um, despite artificial intelligence and everything else. And secondly, I think finance has gone astray in my lifetime. I started out in finance in 1985, and the papers that you wanted to read looked a lot like physics papers, and you could kind of understand them. And what's happened in the last um, 25 or 30 years, I think it's the malign French influence. They've taken over a very axiomatic approach to finance, and they write about finance as though it's, a math as though it's axiomatic mathematics with uh, lemmas and, and deductions, and don't seem to worry about whether those axioms and lemmas actually fit the real world. And um, finance papers, a lot of them have become, well, that the, the style of writing is much more like a pure mathematics paper. And 
the 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 degree of efficacy is sort of uh, inversely proportional to the to the rigor of the paper. So I I don't know what the solution is, but education has certainly gone in that direction. And uh, so one answer to your question: What's going wrong is the illusion of complexity. So the idea that complex problems need complex solutions. They need complex solutions if you are in a stable world. That's where big data works. Where right? tomorrow is like yesterday. Big data does not work, uh, even for uh, predicting customer predicts. Yeah. So, uh, and we in in finance, uh, and including financial regulation, uh, the everything gets always more complex. If something doesn't work, you make it complex. So Basel I had about 30 pages. Basel II had 347 pages. Basel III had over 600 pages. So that's, and Basel IV, God knows if it comes, you know, will have even more because of that type of illusion. If you calculate the value at risk, as we just heard, and if you're a large bank, uh, you have thousands of risk factors they correlate, you have to estimate the covariances in the order of millions. Good luck. Yeah? This borders on astrology. That's not science. And when I said that before the uh, uh, big financial institutions, nobody rejected the idea that it's astrology. But I said, what else should we do? Of course, there's an alternative. Yeah? You just need to get rid, rid from your complexity illusion. Mm -hmm and think seriously about other mathematical structures that don't optimize, like uh, non-compensatory structure, like trees. You know? They're all empirically built, but they try to be robust, not fine-tuned on the past. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to say that the difference between, I agree with what he said, and the difference between finance and between physics or mathematics is that people have memory and Planets don't. And if you say something, if you write down a law about the planets, they don't change their behavior once you've written it down. Whereas if you write down some financial model, people start to use it and the whole world changes quite dramatically and the regime shifts and the future is not like the past. And people remember what happened and then they remember their past mistakes, but go on to make different mistakes. So uh, yeah, there, there's no stability. It's part of the problem, I think, again, and I think you, you wrote in your paper that uh, kind of thinking is hard and by using models we can get other people to think for us. So it's part of the problem that finance be using models that we don't understand. Is part of the problem that we're using models that we don't understand? Or that many people don't understand, that it's become too, too difficult, that we have abstracted it, that we see some of these models, they appear to work, we use them, but not necessarily the people who are using them understand the assumptions behind it. Yeah, that, I think that's true to some extent. I mean, I think the most successful models are still the simple ones. black Scholes is relatively reliable in that it has only a small number of variables. You only have to put in a volatility and you can calculate an option price. Whereas when you start going to I don't know, stochastic volatility, you've suddenly got four or five different parameters that you have to specify. And it's really impossible for anybody to have a good grasp of that. So I think smart places understand that um, and, and filter all their information, filter all their understanding of the world into changing one parameter, namely the volatility. And, and that's, that's sort of, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's a reasonable approach. Um, yeah, the complexity, as Professor Gigerenz has said, it's, the financial system is very complex and it's impossible to come up with a model that takes up takes account of all the complexity. Okay. It's futile. I, I, I could continue, but there are a few questions in the, the audience, do we? Where would you like to go? Yeah, um, fascinating discussion. I, I'm puzzled. I'm wondering if the, maybe we have a false dichotomy here between simple models or simple heuristics and complex models. Because, um, well, to put it in terms of uh, uh, Professor Gigerenz's uh, provocative data about the simple heuristic, the the uh, hiatus heuristic beating the other models. Um, uh, the, I, I was, as from the machine learning perspective, I was thinking, you know, we have there are these regularization techniques that 
kind of right size the model and always push towards the simple models and only you know, obeying Einstein's dictum, you know. Um, and uh, and so I was wondering what, how to explain those results. And I was wondering, so there's a, a kind of a dilemma. Did the other models, were they expressib exp expressive enough to be able to represent the hiatus heuristic and just didn't find it? And why not? Or did or could they not even represent the hiatus heuristic? In which case, was that a fair comparison? That's a very good question. So, for instance, we find when we do machine learning uh, models on data that they often find a fast and fruity tree. Not uh, uh, so they can find these things. Yeah? Uh, regularization, your other point, uh, is a different philosophy. You start with no theory about the subject matter, hmm? and then, but you uh, understand that you might overfit, uh, yeah? and then you cut from behind. Hmm? Uh, the, the science of heuristic is different. It starts with a theory, hmm? and then uh, just tries to, the question is just find the best uh, uh, variable and look how they correlate, what the additional contribution of other things are. Hmm? So uh, ideally, if, if the, your question is about machine learning, I, I would say we need to get mach machine learning uh, uh, back to, uh, uh, to realize that something can be learned from the human brain hmm? and, and a combination here. Hmm? And also, the, your question is again, um, couldn't be the, another uh, machine learning technique that could do better than the random forest here? <laughs> Why don't you ask, could there be another heuristic that's even better than this one? Mm -hmm. So we are also asking very imbalanced questions about, because of our idea, it must be more complex. Complex is better. Mm -hmm. Manuel, thank you very much. Um, I'm not a, a, I'm hoping more than ever that uh, my law professor who said there's never a stupid question is right right now, but um, I'm not an economist, I'm not a cognitive scientist, I'm not an economic journalist, philosopher, psychologist, um, I'm not even a current practitioner. So I'm probably the nearest you've got in this room to a layman. Um, good, you said that a body requires all the organs to function, we talked about intuition. Um, I'd posit that for the other eight billion other people who aren't in those categories of experts, may well care more whether not if there's a mind of the market or the market is a mind, but whether the market has a soul or in more kind of uh, layman's terms, kind of a heart. And is it possible that the markets will fail not through us not understanding the mind but not understanding the heart. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, there is. Of course, there is all kind of motives out there, and for instance, um, just whether you have skin in the game makes a difference. Whether it's your own. So, uh, in my observation, when I work with companies, no, no, outside the financial market with companies. Uh, large companies uh, have a culture of that is defensive, hmm, where one tends to protect oneself against uh, critique, and the uh, what happens with the company is second. Hmm. A family business doesn't care about the next quarterly report, hmm, uh, plans long time for for the children and even the uh, over next generation and has, for instance, no problem with intuition, while uh, uh, managers in large companies, according to my studies, uh, admit in personal conversations or by anonymous tests that about half of all important decisions in international big corporations are at the end a gut decision. That means, hmm, uh, one has looked through all the data, but the data doesn't tell you what to do. And then, based on your experience, you feel you should not do this. Yeah? 
and decide on that. Yeah? <coughs> That's an intuitive decision. And intuition is uh, equally important here, and it's based on experience. It's not what uh, the behavioral economist's war against intuition is about. Yeah? And, but then they would not admit it in public because they fear. And uh, what's happening then is that one hires a consulting firm hmm, to, uh, to justify the already taken uh, decision after the fact. Hmm. When I talk with uh, large consulting firms and I ask them privately, uh, how many of your decisions are at the end, uh, uh, sorry, how many of your customer contacts involve uh, justifying decisions already made Mm -hmm. So the principle of yeah, the largest uh, consulting firm worldwide told me, um, Mr. Gigerenzer, if you don't mention my name, I tell you, it's over 50%. <laughs> so that, is, uh, that gets on what you're saying. Yeah? There is so many other things, so, so much psychology involved, so much anxiety yeah, about justification, about being blamed, yeah, that it actually hurts the companies. And family business, which have a, a feeling of belonging together, yeah, are less vulnerable to this problem. My guess is that that's probably true with central banks as well, in that there are people working on DSGE, dynamic stochastic, general equilibrium, incredibly complicated models. And my guess would be that those are just used to justify, justify strategies or tactics that are uh, reached by a much simpler intuitive argument, or at least heuristic argument. Could I just follow up a little bit from the, the question on whether the market has a mind or whether the market has a soul? Um, but we are here talking about the market mind hypothesis, and we have party questions about to Patrick, but also I'm interested in the, the two eminent speakers and to take their views on this. Uh, and this is something which came up over the, the dinner last night in terms of verification, falsification, and how do we know? So we had the talk here on how do we know, and we start off with intuitions, and we have theories, and we have models, and then we might have data and statistics to try things out. Um, and I think, was it John Kay talked yesterday about the efficient market hypothesis in terms of, it may not be a perfect model or hypothesis, but it's really useful for decision making. So we then take it to the Fish, the, the market mind hypothesis or the cognitive economic theory, how might we go about establishing whether this is a, a theory or something which will have predictive power and something which we know that it, it's there? Maybe you're putting the speakers on the spot here, but, yeah. but, but that may go also to, to Patrick. And to how might we go about testing whether this is really a a useful theory. I think Patrick wants to go first. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so um, one way would be to go into the processes that are happening in uh, financial institutions uh, that uh, Emmanuel was talking about hmm, and, and analyze for instance, the, the waste in this, what's actually happening there. Hmm? So the waste in terms of defensive decision making, about protecting oneself, hmm? and even to the degree that you, you could see that part of the reasons of the last financial crisis were not only that the mathematical models were wrong and suggesting, uh, so, but also that those who, uh, by their experience, felt it's bursting at some point, hmm? But if I now say we sell all our toxic papers and it will burst only in three years, huh? I'm fired in between because the other competitors are. So this is defensive decision making that protects the uh, person, the analyst, but it hurts the, f the company and society in general. Huh? So I would s think about the idea that the market has a mind, yeah, analyzing this type of psychological processes that are happening. Yeah, and when we uh, do them, then we need to do the changing the environment because uh, 
uh, to prevent that people hmm, uh, continue dancing as long the music plays, huh, as it was said, yeah, knowing huh, that by dancing they will bring down their own company. Hmm. So uh, that would be one way to look at these processes. Hmm. And also uh, that might help that uh, to see that there might be different minds of markets, not only one. There is the one that we have today, and there might be another one that we might have, want to have. Thank you. Sorry, Emmanuel, could you come in now and then we'll go to Patrick? About, about the mind of the market? That's correct. Carrying on this discussion. Yeah, um, I, I, have a, I have a somewhat peripheral remark to make in that I just think, um, I'm going back to what I was saying about education, and I just think the world has become enamored of probability theory and statistics and all sorts of things that don't, that, um, yeah, all, all sorts of things that, uh, don't really describe the world and describe in, in, in Garrett's words, describe a world of risk rather than a world of uncertainty. And there's too much love of teaching statistics. I'm sorry, this is my hobby horse or my pet peeve. I notice in California and various places, people are wanting to drop the teaching of calculus for the teaching of statistics and it, for, for people in high school. And uh, I'm, I'm very sad about all this. I still think it's necessary to learn the classic ways of thinking. Um, sorry, that's go ahead, Patrick. Okay, um, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, uh, talk a lot. Uh, have a big answer. Uh, just, a, just a few things. Um, as I've said to many people, I'm the first to admit that the market mind hypothesis is a fledgling theory, and um, it needs, for example, uh, 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 to execute projects that put empirical meat to the theoretical bones and all of that. Um, I also uh, am reminded, uh, uh, so this is a more philosophical uh, answer um, of, of Hayek, who was a good friend of Popper. Um, uh, and uh, Popper, of course, was about all about falsification, etc. And Hayek said, uh, yes, but as we start to explore more and more complex systems, uh, we may uh, uh, need to pay uh, less falsification as the price of exploring this. And ultimately, of course, uh, practical dualism, uh, Hayek uh, basically acknowledges we do not understand our own minds, so we have to uh, apply that, for example. But in, in terms of the, of the practical uh, part, uh, and this comes to, to, to Gerrit's answer in terms of what we should explore uh, in our uh, research manifesto, which, it sounds big, but you know, it gives an overview of, of the, of the, of the uh, framework kind of how we would want to do research. We also have a number of practical projects that I very much would like to run and that I think cover a lot of that putting that empirical meat to the to the bones. Um, it's just uh, uh, I, as you know uh, and what I will say is something more about at the end of the of, of the of the conference uh, you know it's it's perhaps the elephant in this room. I talk about the elephant in economics room in my primer the elephant in this room is perhaps that our research program isn't funded yet. We need, we need to get funding and then, you know, um, then we can do uh, uh, some of this stuff. Although, yeah, there, there will always be limitations because we're dealing with a complex adaptive system. I don't know if you have more time, but I, oh, okay. Someone's been waiting very patiently uh, yeah, and then sure. we'll come to Dylan and I think I'm going to finish there. Hi, thank, thanks for those very interesting talks. So uh, since we're in Edinburgh, I wanted to put in a word for David Hume because his problem of induction seems to be the big theme of this morning. Um, and when he gave uh, the famous example of the skepticism about induction is how do you know the sun will rise tomorrow? And that seems a crazy example because we're dealing with uh, the solar system, a very regular physical system, and it just keeps uh, doing its thing. But the lesson I'm hearing about the markets is that we really should be skeptical about induction. Um, past just doesn't resemble the future. We shouldn't expect it to uh, do so well with that. Um, so question I had um, 
talks, connecting the two talks, was um, with the idea of theories, the thought was that you're like tracking some deep structure symmetries in the universe, and we might disagree that they're really um, the fundamental reality because no physical theory should be accepted as the final theory, like even Einstein's um, subject to future revision, people think. But evolved heuristics, we have a biological intelligence which seems to work well enough dealing with social worlds, um, living worlds where you know there is there really isn't as much regularity from past to future as with physics so is it appropriate to think of those evolved heuristics as if you like the theories of those complex unpredictable uncertain systems in the sense that there is some intuition going on there picking up on some simplicity which um gets you through that uncertain world so is that a fair comparison to make between the heuristics and the theoretical intuition that was talked about in the second talk. Actually, I just okay. Well, you you can answer that, Gary, but I just wanted to say something in relation to what Patrick said about Hayek, and I think one of the important things for market mind hypothesis or understanding any of this in general is to understand clearly what's an abstraction and what's concrete. And Hayek points out somewhere that. In the physical world, gases and macroscopic things are concrete and atoms are abstractions. But in the financial world, it's people that are the, are the real things like gases, the microscopic things, people, and the market is an abstraction. And I think it's very important to understand that the market is some abstraction made out of many people. And it may have a mind, but one has to, I think, think of it in some sense as a as a collective behavior of people. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I understood your question, but the if it's uh, so heuristics are take care with, as I said, uncertainty, intractability, and uh, so incommensurability, where things because they don't need to to add everything up, yeah? mm -hmm. and. The, the key reason why there is so much skepticism against heuristics, so uh, traditional econ economics, they play no role. For Kahneman and Thaler, it's the deviation from homo economicus, yeah, and they believe in homo economicus, and the blame is never on the theory, always on the mind. Hmm? So that's not my vision. Huh? So that is... That's the problem. And then there is no serious uh, or very little serious research on heuristics because the idea is if you think logical, you're always better. Huh? That's a huge mistake. Huh? Uh, logic is helps you a little bit, but, but you wouldn't even understand. And it goes so far that, for instance, the heuristics and biases program eliminates all psychology from rationality, anything be it heuristic, intuition, emotion, anything yeah, is a source of error because uh, this mainstream behavioral economics, uh, and there are others, uh, uh, takes uh, the axioms, the expected utility maximization and Bayesian updating much more seriously than most economists hmm, and confuse it uh, with what you should do. And then we get the story about uh, Homo economicus is, uh, yeah, how we should be, hmm? Hmm? even if it, it's not even possible. Uh, no computer can solve an intractable problem. And we are called Homo Simpsons. Hmm? <laughs> yeah? and, that, and then you get the entire uh, uh, governmental paternalism out of that, and nudging. Yeah? And you get a world yeah, in which people are not taken seriously because of the alleged erroneous intuitions. Eh? And you get a world in which paternalism comes back. We had enough in the 20th century. We don't want more eh, of the nudging. We need people who learn how to make decisions themselves. Hmm? And here you need statistical thinking for a situation of risk. Eh? And you need heuristic thinking for the rest. Hmm? And you may need narratives. Eh? And uh, so, like, 
the invisible hand. Huh? The story is, by the way, wrong. There are pictures with visible hands. Huh? <laughs> but again, a good story. Huh? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is an entire worldview behind that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need the courage to deal with uncertainty and also the courage to say less can be more. Dylan, uh, time. Yeah, and just very quickly, one comment and one question for, for both of you. The, the comment is um, uh, maybe slightly pedantic, but um, I think there are uh, you know, numerous reasons, valid reasons to be critical of, of, of economics. We're hearing a lot of them. We're, we hear more this afternoon. Um, but there's one which I think doesn't quite make sense, which is the inability of economists to predict crashes. Um, because, and the reason that doesn't make sense to me is because a crash is a surprise. Definitionally, it's a surprise. Um, if everyone predicted it, 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 it couldn't happen. It's not that it wouldn't happen, it couldn't happen. So the inability to predict crashes, and you know, why didn't you economists see 2008 coming? Well, actually, some people did, but most people didn't. Uh, and, and that's why it was such a big crash, because it was such a surprise. So actually, if we had a, um, a better and deeper understanding of, of how an economy behaved, and were capable of designing a more robust economic system, we wouldn't have those crashes, not because they were predicted, but because we actually understood the kind of um, the system design, which you know is kind of theoretical. As I said, maybe slightly bit antique, but I wanted to kind of um, uh, make that point or, or offer that comment. The question is, um, and this is to both of you, uh, and it concerns uh, Professor Geigerenzer's kind of um, heuristic research program. Um, um, uh, Professor Derman was saying that the difference between analogy and, and theory is that, you know, analogy is, is a kind of conceptual <laughs> heuristic, um, a kind of pattern recognition heuristic, but um, um, a theory is, uh, is an explanation of, of, of what is, a statement of what is. Uh, and it seems to me that Professor Guy Garenza's heuristics are far more akin to a statement of what is, what does actually happen, how the world is and how people are and how people think. Uh, why do you think that um, the kind of economics community, the broader economics community, and again, this is to both of you, why hasn't the broader economics community tried to, to build on that foundation? Why isn't that taught in Economics 101? Right? Why isn't that the first thing that, that um, um, the economics students learn? Why do you think that? Uh, I, I, I agree with what you said about heuristics. I think they are close to theories. They're descriptions of the way people behave. They don't rely on analogies. Um, I used to have an example when my son was very small. I used to bump him on my knee and, and um, say half a pound of tapani rice, half a pound of treacle, mix them up and make them nice. Pop goes the weasel and drop him. And he would chortle with glee. He was like two years old. And I did it. And he said again, and I did it like 16 times. And on the 17th time, he said, why isn't it funny anymore? And... Um, <laughs> And I was sort of impressed, A, at his perception, at his introspection, but B, I think it's a theory that if you repeat a joke many times, it doesn't become funny anymore and no neurological explanation will add any more insight into it. And I think the same is true of Professor Geiser's heuristics. They're closer to facts and theories. The reason why the economic world doesn't pay attention to it is, I don't know, love of mathematics and which many people have written about and love of this formal approach, which doesn't really pay attention. Yeah, it's, it's a love of, um, love of advanced mathematics and the feeling that that gives authority to what they're writing. Yeah. Uh, I also think that's one of the reasons. Huh? It's not just love of mathematics, it's love of a specific kind of mathematics. Huh? Yes. So fast yes. and fruity trees are a different kind of mathematics. Huh? Uh, not an optimization mathematics, a structural okay. type of mathematics. Eh? And why isn't that important? So it's a very specific uh, school. And, um, but the good news are that uh, there are people in economics eh, who pay attention. For instance, the late Reinhard Selten, one of the Nobel laureates, we did a book together on the adaptive toolbox. Eh? Herbert Simon is the, the, the mind behind all of that. Uh, Vernon Smith distinguishes between substantive and ecological rationality and acknowledges in his noble speech that's basically the same concept that, that we are having. Hmm? And 
Uh, and there is even macroeconomic research. There's a paper by Dozy and Stiglitz and others who have tested macroeconomic models in in really situations of disruption hmm? and uh, ag against a simple heuristic that we have studied. It's a recency heuristic. Basically, you take the last data point, nothing else, because you know the rest, big data, kills you hmm, in disruption. Eh? And, and then they published a paper, and uh, with the conclusion, they found that the simple heuristic predicts better than the macro. <coughs> now predicts, not fitting data, huh? predicts better, and conclude that fast and frugal heuristics are not an approximation to uh, optimality. They're probably the best thing to do hmm? under uncertainty again. Yeah? So there is some awareness. The big problem is rather uh, what has become mainstream uh, behavioral economics, which did not dare to uh, think about a new, th how to extend the theory to uncertainty, to intractability, to, uh, but accepted the theory and uh, blamed every human uh, difference as an error and bias. Yeah? And that's, that was uh, efficient to get Nobel Prizes yeah? because you didn't dare to deviate too much. But it didn't help economic theory to, to, to get a broader grasp of phenomena that it needs to get.